Uh, welcome, friends, dear students of Israel Bible Center. Welcome to um, uh, Roundtable Talk series. Today, we are uh, privileged to have um, Dr. James D De Francisco, who is founder and president of Milta Ministries. You will hear from him very, very soon. We also have a privilege of um, having with us uh, Andrew Gabriel Roth, founder and president of One Faith, One People Ministries. So today, um, at the initiative of both of these gentlemen and really private conversations, I think, um, I wanted to, at the invitation, I should say, I wanted to bring up a question of, um, of Aramaic uh, background of New Testament scriptures. Um, and this whole discussion of the importance of, um, New, Test uh, of New Testament Aramaic and Syriac witness. So um, I'm wondering if I could start per perhaps with um, Andrew Gabriel Roth. Um, uh, uh, Andrew, tell us the way you see it. Um, why, uh, why would uh, any Christian at all from Eastern, Western, Protestant, Catholic, um, uh, Orthodox traditions be interested at all <coughs> in um, any questions having to do with the um, linguistic Aramaic background of uh, New Testament? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, for one thing, um, Aramaic is the native language of our Savior. Uh, we call him Yeshua, but known to the world as Jesus Christ. We need to start with the fact that Jesus and all of his disciples, including those who wrote about him, were native Aramaic speakers, okay? Luke may have been very talented as a bilingual Gentile, but still very strong in Aramaic, as is very clear from his writings. And the other thing I'll say is, in the book of Acts, chapter one, verse 19, we read that the place where Judas died was called Akeldama, which is a thoroughly Aramaic phrase. That is not a Hebrew name, which means field of blood. And it says, and this was the, in the language of the locals of the country. Mm -hmm. So right there in the book of Acts, we are told that the people in Jerusalem were native Aramaic speakers. So that's mm -hmm. one piece of it. Now we can okay. get into a whole extensive discussion about how for the past 700 years before that, Aramaic became the main language, not the only language, Hebrew was still important, but one of the main languages, particularly for the poorer people, for the fishermen, for the, for the uh, people that followed Messiah, uh, were, were, were more fluent in Aramaic than they were in Hebrew, and they became disciples, and, and they wrote their own books. But also, it's important because it's an ancient witness. As I often like to teach, Eastern languages go east and Western languages go west. It's not that the Greek isn't important. The story of how Paul took the, the New Testament to the Roman Empire is very important. I wouldn't take a thing away from it. But we mm -hmm. need to remember that Peter went east. Peter mm -hmm. had a 14 year head start on Paul. Peter outranked Paul and Peter founded more than twice the assemblies or churches that Paul did. And that's a story that needs to be told to give the full ancient support, Eastern and Western, for the, the environment through which the New Testament, the Brit Hadasha, for the environment in which those writings emerged. You can't tell this whole story without telling the Aramaic side of it, too. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, James, go ahead and just tell us your initial reaction. Uh, to a very simple question, why uh, why is Aramaic studies important? Yes, I believe it is extremely important for a variety of reasons, including those that Andrew just mentioned. Um, I'd like to start, though, with a comment right from your own book, The Jewish Gospel of John. On page 240... You you're... man after my own heart. Oh, yeah, I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> You say, sometimes I wonder how many things we miss 
by reading everything in the Gospels through our universal lenses of generalization and premature application, page 240. And you're talking about uh, the uh, Lord's Prayer there and the kingdom coming to Israel. Um, this morning, I was in a meeting, with a, a class with an Orthodox Jewish rabbi and a um, Greek Orthodox linguist. And we've been studying Hebrew for the past three or four years together. And it's amazing the nuances of meaning that comes out of the Semitic languages that are totally missed when someone reads an English translation. Nothing new to either one of you. I know both of you have sure. taught that yourselves. Um, I've had many students, I asked a class on last Saturday, uh, I said, you've been studying Aramaic for a while. Tell me some of the benefits that you've received. And those benefits are all over the scoreboard. Um, some of them make comments like, well, I've learned nuances of meaning, such as the, the phrase where Jesus tells the rich man that it's easier for a, is it a camel or is it a rope to go through the eye of the needle? Well, if you, if you translate that as rope, a large rope, then you're pulling the strands apart. It's very much in context with the rest of the story. And these kind of things have enriched people's <clears throat> lives in terms of practical value that they would otherwise miss. I had an elder many years ago who was in the church for a long time. And he came up to me after a sermon one time and, and said, you know, I've never understood that text before until you explained it today. And it happened to be a different text. But this has happened numerous times mm -hmm. when people study the nuances, whether it be Hebrew or whether it be Aramaic, that they totally miss in the, um, in the English or even in the Greek. And it's also much more fluid. So there's hundreds of nuances and in some cases differences in translation where you could compare a Greek text or a translation with the Aramaic. In my case, I use the Peshitta uh, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in addition to that, uh, picking up where Andrew uh, talked about the Aramaic being the lingua <laughs> franca, from around 800 BC until 700 CE, when um, Islam ruled much of the Near East, Aramaic was the primary language of the people. And um, when Paul brought his uh, messages into Asia Minor, and especially into Greek city-states, there was a large emphasis on Greek in that area. And in the Western world, because of the Persian Empire being separate from the Roman Empire, and then later the Islamic uh, people, the Muslims, being separate from the Roman, Holy Roman Empire, you have a whole lot of Christianity that was separated from the Western world. And this is very uh, vast in its richness. So the, the value there is tremendous. Yeah, James, I, I really don't know if you know this or not, but uh, you probably do, coming from Aramaic background. But um, uh, my what, what, when I was looking for uh, uh, a doctoral thesis to write and to defend, um, uh, I, I, I very unexpectedly stumbled on Afrahad. Um, and so my, my, my studies, this is, this is the three or four years that I spent actually reading, um, studying Syriac and reading Syriac and with Afrahat as a uh, fourth century uh, contemporary to, um, to John the Golden Mouth, uh, who, who, was, who was in the West and, and he, he is in the East. And it's, uh, it was I was fascinated by one particular thing, and this is in particular um, characteristic of Afrahad, maybe Afram, uh, because of the century, which is the fourth century, is uh, very, uh, I don't know about Ephraim, I actually haven't studied Ephraim that well, but Afrahad clearly does not know Greek. And so all this theological development that happens in the Western church 
that culminates eventually in the Council of Nicaea and all those things um, seem to basically escape Afrahad. And so Afrahad is reasoning one independently, but then presumably, possibly, actually, um, still preserving some of the older Semitic patterns of thinking, mm -hmm. not affected in any way. Now, the moment you get to the fifth century, mm -hmm. the Greek thing just breaks in like a flood. And even if you're Eastern church father in the fifth century, it's already beginning to sound more and more and more as the West. Uh, but but I thought that before we go on any further, folks, maybe maybe um, uh, maybe Andrew, maybe uh, you could tell us just for those of the students that um, simply don't know enough about Aramaic at all, <clears throat> give us a little bit of a background on the language itself. You know, okay. anything at all, <clears throat> basic kind of knowledge as to what what should a, a, a new student of this topic know about uh, Aramaic in relationship to Greek, in relationship to Hebrew, to perhaps other languages, anything, uh, ge geography, perhaps anything. Okay. Like that. Well, I'd be happy to. I mean, we need to look at the role of Aramaic as a biblical language. Most of the languages that get the most attention are, of course, Hebrew and Greek. But Aramaic has always been a sister language to Hebrew. And the scripture itself points to its role. And I'm talking about in the Old Testament now, in the Tanakh. But one thing, we know that when Jacob and Laban have their confrontation, Jacob has upped his stakes and taken his wives and his children, and Laban has tracked him. Mm -hmm. And when Laban follows him, he says to, to Jacob, I'm going to now make a Yegar Sachadutha, which is a thoroughly Aramaic phrase in the Hebrew Torah, a witness heap, which is even translated by Jacob as Galid, because Galid means witness heap in Hebrew. Okay. Mm -hmm. What we find out is that Abraham comes from Ur. Ur is a thoroughly Aramaic speaking place, although he may have spoken an older language called Akkadian, which is which is kind of a separate situation. I just want to acknowledge that, that there is a bit more depth on that side, but we can't necessarily go into all of that right now. But the point is, is that significant amounts of Abraham's family were Aramaic speakers. For example, we are told that we, the Israelites had to swear in Deuteronomy 26, verse 5, my father was a wandering Aramean. And that's exactly what it says. It says Arame in, in the Hebrew. So we see that the Hebrews and the Arameans, they lived close to each other. They were separated by a river. Another great example, when you get into the book of Judges, you get the whole Sibboleth, Shibboleth thing. That's, that's happening there in Judges, I believe that's chapter 12. And what a lot of folks don't realize is that when you had the, the tribes of, I think it was Gad and Ephraim and Manasseh, they're settling on the eastern side of the Jordan. They want to settle first, and then the rest of the Israelites settle later, but they go and join them for war. That's the deal that they strike. The people who are on the eastern side of that, of that river are going to aspirate and say Sibboleth. Whereas the people who are on the other side of the Jordan, who are the Hebrews, and even the word Hebrew means those from across, they're going to say Shibboleth. And this distinction between aspiration on the Aramaic side and non-aspiration on the Hebrew side persists to this very day. So this is not just a biblical folktale. This is a snapshot of linguistic reality. Now we're going to fast forward to the fact that when you had the Assyrians invade, uh, King Hezekiah, they had destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BCE. Now in 700 BCE, they have now put 185,000 troops on Hezekiah's doorstep, okay? And they send a delegation. And what the, uh, the Hezekiah's men come to meet them, and this is in 2 Kings 18, and they say to this delegation, speak to us in Aramaic for we understand it, but do not speak in the language of Judean, because at that time, 
Aramaic was a diplomatic language. The Assyrians understood it. The Babylonians understood it. And the Hebrew people living in that part of the world understood it. But their hope was, of course, because the majority were still speaking Hebrew, that they wouldn't hear surrender terms be coming across from the Assyrians to demoralize the people that were that were just speaking Hebrew. However, when the Babylonians invaded in 586 BCE and Nebuchadnezzar took everybody into captivity, now they've gone into an Aramaic speaking country. And when they come back from Babylon, the books that were produced in the exile, which is to say Daniel, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, have heavy Aramaic influences in them. Daniel is about one third Aramaic, so is Ezra, so is a line from Jeremiah. And, and so post-exilic, Aramaic is becoming the main language of the Hebrew people. And this shows up when Ezra and the exiles come back under him and they build synagogues and they, they, they then standardize the learning infrastructure that comes into the time of what we call the Great Assembly, uh, which you, you gentlemen know very well about that time during the Persian period. The Persians are Aramaic speakers. So Aramaic is becoming, archaeologically speaking, part of the corpus of the culture for the Hebrew people that have returned. They, their, their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents spoke Aramaic in Babylon. They continue to speak it as they come back. And so by the time we get to Messiah, you have this infrastructure set up that if you wanted to pray or go to the temple, you're going to basically do that in Hebrew. But if you wanted to uh, participate in wider Semitic culture, you're going to speak Aramaic. And this is the exact situation that we find when the Gospels open.